Uh, so this neuropathology for February, uh, case one, uh, Turkey, if you're on, this is a 55-year-old male with several weeks of progressive neck pain, radiating to the right hand, subjective weakness in the right hand and the right leg, numbness, gait imbalance, had a previous spine tumor that was resected back in 2006. Uh, pathology at that time demonstrated a schwannoma. Uh, the current symptoms, he says, are similar to the previous presentation. Uh, okay. This is his neurological exam. Uh, he is full strength, except for the right side, he's a little bit weaker in the right-handed intrinsics and the right uh, distal leg. Reflex in the right leg are three plus. Uh, he doesn't have clone Um Next steps, David, uh, sorry, Turkey, if you're on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, we definitely get some images. Um, I'll do an MRI, the spine, um, you know, MRI, C-spine given that he has weakness of the upper lower extremities. Sure. Uh, so this is the uh, T2 sequence. Uh, what do you mm -hmm. see? Yeah, so I see that there is a, um, almost from C4 to um, C7 cord expansion um, with uh, hyperintensity um, of the cord. Seems like it's an intramedullary uh, lesion. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, uh, you know, there's like a small, maybe possibly syrinx or like cyst uh, within the within the tumor, probably cyst. Uh, this is the contrasted T1. Oh, sorry, this is the non-contrast T1. This is the T1 with contrast. So can, can you tell where this tumor is? Yeah, so um, yeah, this tumor expands from, expands from the C5, C7. Um, enhancing on uh, T1 with, with GAD. Um, axial wise, it seems that it's uh, it's not intramedullary, it's uh, extramedullary intradural with, uh, seems like cord compression ventrally. Um, all right, so kind of what is your differential diagnosis here? So um, given that it's an intradural extramedullary, uh, could be a, it's uh, modestly enhancing, so it could be a um, schwannoma, a meningioma. Um, also, it could be um, um, any um, a metastatic disease, but again, mainly it's extra dural. And um, yeah, uh, so you mentioned blastoma, mm -hmm. it can be uh, extra medullary. Yeah, so I think so. This is actually a case uh, that Dr. Yurko requested. I think the the uh, the point here was uh, it's it's a little difficult to tell exactly whether it's inter intermedullary or extramedullary because it's possible that the intermedullary component can be kind of uh, fungating out and extending into the extramedullary component. But you're right for the extramedullary and intermedullary uh, differential diagnosis epidemoma, astrocytoma. Um, but I wanted to review the pathology slides here uh, because it was interesting, actually, this tumor, what was given on the initial pathology back in 2006 was different from what returned on the repeat pathology now from the re-resection. Um, so Dr. Gultek, and if you're, uh, if you're available, uh, here are the slides. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so this is yeah really an interesting case. How I got involved was uh, Timur sent a frozen on this case this year and uh, in the second surgery, and uh, we from the get go we thought a pandemoma in the frozen and also in the uh, permanent sections. So we finalized the case in 2023 as a pandemoma, and I will show you those slides. Uh, what you're looking at here is the surgery from 2006. I pulled the slides. This is from uh, 15, 16 years ago, right? And I read the uh, report from Dr. Norenberg at the time, a former neuropathologist here. Uh, he's saying it's a schwannoma, but also interestingly in the comment warning about 
possible adverse behavior for some reason. And I think the KI67 was high and there was areas of uh, uh, hypercellularity, etc. So you're looking at it here. This is the that case from 16 years ago. Um, as you can see on low power, it's a variably cellular tumor. On high power, however, I can clearly see that there are perivascular on the right upper picture, perivascular pseudorosettes, meaning there is a central um, blood vessel surrounded by a relatively nuclear-free zone. And then the cells that are sending their processes towards the blood vessel wall. So that's the definition of a perivascular pseudorosette. On again, high power on the left lower corner, you can see the uniform round to oval cells. They really don't look like the classic schwannoma where the cells are elongated, essentially tapering spindle nuclei. On the right lower corner, you can see the nodule in the center, which represents an area of relative hypercellularity. So to me, even you know, in the past, this case, if they had done the correct immunostains at the time, uh, this is an ependymoma. I don't think that there's a change in diagnosis, obviously. Nature is nature. We are the ones who are approaching it with different tools. So this was an ependymoma, even though there was an extramedullary component, which is definitely known to occur. Did, did so, they not stain for S100 or other HNK1, or they just yeah. did it based on histology? Uh, thanks for the question. Let me show you the second case, and then, uh, and then I will talk about the immunos. So 2023, yes, same, uh, more or less same histology. Uh, again, areas of hypercellularity. On the left lower, there is a perivascular pseudorosette. It's not just one. That was a lot. This case is histologically ependymoma. There is no question about it. So next uh, slide will show the answer to Dr. Levy's question. So it stands with GFAP number one, which you know you, you rarely see in schwannomas, especially this robust staining with perivascular accentuation is typical for ependymoma. Suxtan is a transcription factor. It should be positive in a schwannoma, nuclear stain, negative. So this effectively rules out schwannoma in this case. Collagen type four, I use it to show the pericellular uh, basal lamina in, in Schwann cells, negative, only stains blood vessel walls. So this is supposed to be also positive in schwannomas. EMA shows punctate labeling, which is typical for um, ependymoma. Therefore, I have no choice but to call it ependymoma. And this immunoprofile definitely rules out schwannoma, supports ependymoma. So does that answer the question? Or you want to go back to the previous case and learn about the immunos? Because they did... In the previous case, they did S100 and KI67. And S100 was vaguely positive, but it doesn't help because S100 can be positive in a, in a lot of neural tumors. And, uh, and I think uh, I, have, I have now a more uh, developed and definitive immunoprofile. I don't think they even asked the question about ependymoma in that case, because had they did done that, they would have done GFAP at least, so um, and reticulin. So reticulin rules out schwannoma or collagen type four is the modern modern uh, counterpart of that. So uh, anyway, I have no doubt that this is ependymoma, and also the recurrence uh, probably speaks for that too, uh, unless you know you don't do a complete surgery on a schwannoma, a true schwannoma, very rarely, if ever, would recur. And there is an intramedullary component, so maybe that was a difficulty at the time. But this is it. Uh, thanks for asking this question, Timur. I think this is an educational case. We're done. All right, awesome, thank you. Any questions? 
All yeah. right. Um, and so just kind of briefly looking at the surgical approach, uh, uh, Damien, if you're on, what would you recommend for this and how would you approach it? Hey, I'm here. Sorry, we joined a little bit late. I didn't see the actual images. Um, uh, but... So you can click an epidemoma, uh, an intermedular uh, cervical. Uh, I mean, so I mean, posterior um, laminectomies, kind of spanning the lesion. What is it? Three, four, five, like five from five to seven, um, to you know, fully expose the uh, the overlying dura. Then you can ultrasound to confirm you're above and below the above and below the level uh, of the tumor, uh, and then make a. Um, I guess probably midline dural opening, but it's a bit ventral, so um, probably it's going to be a little bit difficult. You may have to kind of like cut the dentate and, and kind of mobilize the um, to look around, get more ventrally. Yeah, and I, here are some intraoperative pictures that uh, Dr. Yurkov sent me. Um, I guess Dr. Yurkov, if you had anything to add, but. Uh, um, uh, from from the uh, but he did tell me that uh, the tumor did look extramedullary at first. But he could track it inside the cord, uh, under the C six nerve. Um, this uh, the pen field is where uh, like inside the cord where it was uh, kind of fungating out. Uh, so just briefly about epidemoma. Epidemoma obviously occurs both in the spine and the brain. Uh, spinal epidemomas come from the central canal and account for seventy five percent of the total uh epidemoma volume. Um, cranial are from epidermal cells in the ventricle. Uh, they're frequently associated with cysts, as we saw here, they're typically benign. Uh, they account for 60% of spinal cord gliomas. Uh, slight predominance in males, typically younger adult age, around 30 to 40. Uh, they're pretty slow growing. 96% of spinal epidermomas are in adults, 4% are in children, 50% are in the cervical and thoracic spine, and 50% are at the conus, leading to mixopapillary epidermomas. Uh, the grading is uh, based on the degree of malignancy on microscopy. Uh, the only grade one sub, uh, grade one epidemoma is the subepidemoma, and grade two mixopapillary epidemoma is now grade two. It was previously grade one on the WHO classification. You can see the other, the other uh, uh, subtypes here. Uh, it's frequently associated with loss of chromosome 22q. Uh, mixopapillary epidemomas are associated with mutations in chromosome seven. The MDM2 gene has been found to be overexpressed. And with uh, higher grades of epidemoma, you have increased expression of KI67. Uh, treatment, as we briefly talked about, gross total resection is preferred uh, to the extent that you can abide, avoid any neurological deficit. Uh, and if you treat the tumor eventually, it'll treat the cyst. You don't have to uh, do anything special for the cyst. Uh, this patient uh, ended up getting radiation therapy, and radiation therapy generally consists of uh, fractional, fractionated external beam radiation with cumulative dose 54 gray. Uh, if you have metastatic or disseminated disease, you need craniospinal radiation. Um, the next case, let's see. Uh, Adam, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect. Uh, this is a 44 year old, 44 year old lady who was initially diagnosed with a, a low thoracic tumor back in 2018. Uh, Dr. Dlovi, this is your case. Uh, she initially had been having worsening back pain, paresthesias down both legs, and numbness in both legs for the last six months. Uh, she's mostly wheelchair bound at this time. Uh, on her neurological exam, she's full strength throughout, uh, decreased sensation in both lower extremities, reflexes, uh, three plus throughout, um, and clonus. Uh, Adam, any next steps that you would do here? Uh, yeah, I would, I would like to get like, um, imaging now. So maybe we can get the, uh, uh, so are they working down both legs? So maybe thoracic and lumbar for her. Sure. Um, uh, this is, uh, let's see. um, this is a picture of the, uh, here, this is a T2. Yes. So, so T2 on the thoracic spine, uh, the UCL uh, intradural intramedullary, uh, tumor. Uh, extending, I'm assuming here from like uh, T10 or T9 uh, or T12. Like um, you can see a cystic component. Uh, my differential diagnosis for this kind of tumor would be a. Um, yeah, this is uh, the, so uh, it might be yeah. intradural, intramedullary. So 
you can you can look at uh, also the contrast uh, would be like um, either ependymoma, hemangioblastoma, astrocytoma. Um, also, might consider Mets given that she had like a thoracic uh, tumor um, before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, here are the pathology slides. Okay, so this one uh, was a moderately cellular uh, tumor uh, that really didn't have any mitotic activity or uh, necrosis or vascular proliferation. You can see on the left lower corner some hyalinized blood vessel walls in the middle midline uh, at, towards the bottom, which are typical for uh, slow growing tumors. That was also on the right side. You can see that was a tremendous amount of calcifications in the tissue submitted. Um, so it looked like an astrocytic tumor versus an ependymoma, and we did immunostains, and we showed this, you know, the pathology to each other as two neuropathologists, and we decided that is there another slide or not? Yeah, this is next slide. Yeah. Okay, so as you can see, strongly OLIC2 positive. This is a uh, glial marker, and OLIC2 is typically negative in ependymomas, and it's GFAP and Vimantin positive. Cash CT7 is low. Um, so we decided that this is a great to astrocytoma histologically. IDH was uh, wild type. Um, so we left it at that, saying that maybe. They can do NGS uh, to further characterize the tumor since it's, after all, it's an astrocytoma, in our opinion, with IDH1 negativity. How old was the patient? She was 44, I believe. Yeah, About so yeah. young. Uh, yeah, 44. You know, other IDH mutations should be sought, etc. cetera. Um, so this was, this was, Briefly, the pathology. Are you aware of any uh, molecular results on this case? Uh, no, I, I didn't see any uh, in uh, the uh, EMR. The, the H3K27M was negative, so it was not an alarming result. Yeah, no, I I looked at the the report. I don't know if you have it in front of you, but I think it you know it it suggests it was grade two, but that. It, the genetic markers were suggestive of something more aggressive. I remember reading in the port, and it just didn't make sense with her presentation, which was pretty indolent. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I looked at the pathology report. I don't know if you're talking about molecular pathology or histopathology. Molecular. Molecular. Le oh, I see. I see. Yeah, because my report does not reflect anything aggressive. Um. I'm sorry that the molecular report is not with me now, but what was, do you remember what was aggressive about it? Because I the, think because of its IDH, uh, like it's um, oh, okay. mutant, mutant, IDH mutant status, something like that. I see, I see. So yeah, if it's a IDH wild type, yeah, uh, which I think that's what you're talking about. There are hmm. two things, right? One, the IDH status, can be uh, alarming to the H3K27M status, which we ruled out. Uh, therefore, yeah, in adults, uh, astrocytomas, which are uh, IDH wild type, have the po potential to act aggressively. We typically see this in the brain, uh, as you all know, but spinal cord astrocytomas are not necessarily you know, technically treated any different uh, from the histology point of view. But I personally did not uh, allude to anything aggressive. I think it's the molecular pathology report. So yeah, the histology is definitely a grade two. Uh, the question remains, is this gonna be a molecular glioblastoma? But uh, I'll take a look at the molecular pathology report. For that to happen, you need to have EGFR amplification, third promoter mutation, chromosome seven X uh, addition or chromosome 10 loss. So these are the WHO uh, rules. 
if the molecular pathology report does not reflect anything, this comes from outside. So this is placed in the patient's chart. It doesn't come to me uh, directly. If those things are not there, then you know I cannot uh, issue a, an a report saying that this is a molecular glioblastoma. I, I'm going to look into it, but the histology doesn't really suggest here. At appreciate, least. appreciate you looking at that. And just, uh, you know, she just presented very indolently, although she was wheelchair brown when she presented, but she had the known tumor for five years with only small amount of growth over that time. And, and the other thing is that, you know, she has a, it was heavily, heavily calcified on CT. Yeah. Uh, Agnes, you didn't show those images, but th those were quite impressive. Uh, and then the last thing is she has a significant scoliosis and it's thoracolumbar junction. You know, you can question why we didn't do a fusion, uh, but typically what I'll do is remove the tumor and if there are issues in the future, she might need it, but usually don't do it at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sumed, if you're on, just do you want to talk about what you would do for the surgical approach for this? Um, okay, you might be busy. So just kind of briefly, uh, you know, as Dr. Levy mentioned, just T11 to T9 to 11, laminectomy opening the dura midline. Uh, you can identify the midline between the dorsum columns where the dorsal veins enter. I open the midline of the corridor shaft with peel stitches, identify the plane around the tumor internally to bulk. Uh, as Dr. Levy mentioned, uh, the tumor was uh, very calcified. Just briefly about astrocytoma, it's the second most common spinal cord tumor in adults, the most common spinal cord tumor in children. It accounts for 40% of all intramedullary spine tumors uh, in the pediatric population. It accounts for 60% of all intramedullary tumors. The peak incidence occurs in the third decade, uh, similar to pneumoma. The mean age of presentation is about 30 years. Again, males are affected more commonly than females. The incidence of astrocytoma uh, uh, in NF1 is higher. Uh, specifically, these are high-grade astrocytomas with pyloid features uh, in NF1. Uh, the uh, WHO also has uh, astrocytoma grading as well. Grade 1 is localized astrocytomas. Grade 2 has infiltration and is characterized by only by cellular atypia. When you look at grade three, you have increased mitotic activity and cellular anaplasia. These were previously known as aplastic astrocytomas uh, with grade anaplastic. four. Sorry, what was it? Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Sorry. And, and, sorry, sorry, anaplastic, that was a typo, sorry. Uh, grade four is characterized by vascular proliferation as well as necrosis, typically with uh, perinecronic palisading themselves. Uh, astrocytomas uh, arise from obviously astrocytic glial cells uh, spinal cord astrocytomas in general have a lower gr histological grade than cranial astrocytomas. Uh, in adults, about 75% are low grade uh, and in, pedi in the pediatric population. Uh, in children under three years, about 80% are low grade. Uh, so all astrocytomas are characterized by hypercellularity and a lack of the like, surrounding capsule and contrast epidemomas. High-grade astrocytomas are more often associated with leptomeningeal dissemination, uh, and about 60% of spinal GBMs uh, have this leptomeningeal spread uh, at the time of presentation. And like in, yeah, so as I mentioned, unlike in epidemomas, there's no clear like kind of capsule or cleavage plane around the uh, tumor to separate it from the cord. Uh, on imaging, spinal astrocytomas typically are seen spanning multiple segments. Uh, one paper showed that about the average length of involvement was about four to seven vertebral body segments. Uh, the thoracic spine was most commonly involved in about two thirds of all uh, patients, followed by the cervical, uh, ex extending up to the cervical in about half. Uh, children can have involvement of the whole cord. Uh, about 3% uh, of adults have isolated coincidentalis involvement. Uh, astrocytomas, uh, as I mentioned, are intramedullary with diffuse expansion of the cord. Uh, they can cause osseous remodeling uh, with some of the slower growing ones with posterior vertebral body scalloping or pedicle or lamina thinning. On MRI, uh, as we talked about before, uh, sometimes if they're eccentric or exophytic, they can appear extramedullary. Um, astrocytomas in general are faster growing than epidemomas and have worse prognosis and surgical resection is the primary treatment. Uh, so just you know, briefly here, 
uh just you know sort of uh compared the two of them uh we went over most of these already but astrocytomas typically don't have uh hemorrhage whereas uh, epidemomas are more commonly associated with hemorrhage and you can have hemosiderin staining at the superior and inferior margins called hemosiderin capping uh rarely they can present with subarachnoid hemorrhage well uh next case this was a uh, case at the request of dr burks uh long are you on Or let's see, how about? Uh, hey, 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 hey. I, I, I'm on. Ignacio. Okay, perfect. Next one, 44 year old lady uh, with a low back pain for five years. She was initially diagnosed with a uh, small fiber neuropathy on muscle biopsy in 2020. She has had worsening back pain for the last six months, uh, radiation of the pain into the hips and the posterior left leg. Now has left leg numbness, paresthesia, subjective weakness, and distance limited gait due to left leg pain. Uh, this is her neurological exam. On the right, she's actually slightly weak with uh, EHL three out of five. Uh, what what will your next steps be here? Uh, I would probably get uh, for the imaging. Um, I would start off with his CTL spine and then uh, MRI spine. Okay, perfect. Um, so actually, she didn't have a CT, but she did have an MRI. This is the uh, non contrast and contrast enhanced T one on the Right, so what do you see here? So uh, sagittal uh, MRI L-spine, I see a, um, what appears to be uh, maybe uh, intradural uh, extramedullary lesion at T12 to L1. It does not appear to be contrast enhancing. It looks um, hypo-intense on T1. Yeah. And this is a T2. Uh, anything uh, yeah so basically iso intense to csf yeah so she didn't have a dwi sequence but just yeah. based on this what would your differential diagnosis be um so i mean uh we see differential diagnosis for um uh, lesion uh, iso intense to csf um uh, maybe like a, a phylum terminal tumor, um, uh, maybe like a, like a lipoma. Yeah. So, you know, so this, so we don't have a DWI, of course, but epidermoid cyst, uh, arachnoid cyst, and then uh, things related to that dermoid endodermal cyst uh, or something infectious, although the, the latter ones would be slightly different on MRI, as I'll explain a little bit, but Epidermoid or arachnoid cyst. These are the pathology slides here. Uh, this is a straightforward pathology. You can see on the left the cystic nature of the um, lesion with some central uh, debris and surrounding epithelial tissues. And on the high power on the right picture, you can see that the left has the squamous epithelium. And uh, inside the cyst, there is the squamous debris. So this is classic uh, epidermoid cyst. Some maybe it may have ruptured and some re uh, caused some reactive changes in the surrounding parenchyma. Sometimes if you see during surgery, uh, fibrosis and inflammatory tissue, that could be the explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the surgical approach to Victor, how would you approach this? Um, hey, Vignesh. Um, lo lo local, uh, localized laminectomy. Um, you can use ultrasound to confirm you are uh, above and below uh, exposure then of um, the lesion and then um, attempts of trying to do gross total resection of um, cyst as well as capsule. Yeah, nice. So that's essentially what was done here. Uh, just briefly about epidermoid cysts, they account for about 0.5 to 1% of all spine tumors in adults, a minority. They account for about 10% of all intraspinal tumors in children. You, uh, males are more commonly affected than females uh, and commonly associated with other spinal malformations like spina bifida or hemivertebrae. Uh, so 
there's kind of a contrast between cranial epidermoids and spinal epidermoids. Cranial epidermoid cysts are almost always congenital in, in origin, but most spinal epidermoids are acquired after birth. Uh, in in that, uh, you know, they'll they'll develop later in life. Congenital epidermoid cysts in the spine, though, are uh, due to anomalous implantation of ectodermal spells, uh, cells during closure of the neural tube between weeks three to five of embryonic life. And congenital spinal epidermoids are typically in the thoracic spine. Acquired spinal epidermoids are typically extramedullary and near and inner space. Uh, typically, these are seen in the lower lumbar spine. Um, and so it was interesting. I actually saw this in some of the literature. They said that acquired spinal epidermoids can actually be a late complication of lumbar puncture resulting from implanted epidermal elements in the spinal canal. Uh, and they had said that, I'm not sure how much this is true, but prior to the introduction of these styleted LP needles uh, that are tapered, up to 40% of spinal epidermoid cysts were attributed to a lumbar puncture that was done in the past. Um, and they said that the incidence has decreased a lot more recently uh, with the within new LP needles. Um, and they said that the time interval between the lumbar puncture and the diagnosis was typically one to 20 years, uh, is what was said in the literature. Uh, on histology, they consist of stratified squamous epithelium supported by an outer layer of collagenous tissue the inner appearance, um, which is like the pearly white appearance, is from progressive desquamation and breakdown of keratin from the epithelial lining into the interior of the cyst. Um, on extra, you can show you can have scalping of the vertebral bodies. Um, so CT shows a hypo-intense lesion with minimal or no enhancement. The, on the MRI, you typically don't have any edema adjacent to the lesion. Uh, it follows CSF on all sequences except for DWI, uh, uh, which is bright. Uh, and in these tumors, typically growth total resection is preferable because if you, you know, leave the cyst wall, it can lead to eventual recurrence. Um, just in comparison to some of these other uh, differential diagnoses, uh, spinal arachnoid cyst typically does not have restriction on DWI, and you generally don't see vertebral body anomalies. Uh, spinal epidermoid cysts contain fat, so they're going to be bright on T1. Uh, and the patients are typically under the age of 20, and spinal neuroenteric cysts are more common in the cervical and thoracic regions and typically ventral to the spinal cord. Uh, next one, case four. Tyler, are you around? How about. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. So this is a 33 year old guy with thoracic back tightness, paresthesias in both legs, and signs of lower extremity myelopathy. Uh, this is his exam. He's fully intact on, on his neurological exam. What would you, how would you start? I just start with like a CT lumbar. Yeah. So uh, this guy did have thoracic, CT. right? Because numbness in the legs. So I'd be worried about like MRI also. Yeah. No, I just yeah, saw it. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, he did have a CT. Uh, I'll talk about it in a bit. It, it I, uh, I wasn't able to see it, but this is the MRI. Okay. The T2 yes. sequence. So it looks like an extra dural, extra medullary lesion. Um, but could be like, well, yeah. So uh, like meningioma um, is one thing I'd think of. Maybe metastasis. It's okay. Contrast enhancing. Yeah. So this may actually be intradural. Uh, oh, of, it's okay. Which, I see. Yeah. The of the dura there, but um, yeah. So what, what do you think? You said meningioma, right? So yeah. Probably, it looks like meningioma, yeah. probably it, um, you know, just given the location, probably not the other intradural extramedullary tumors, but probably meningioma. Uh, here are the pathology slides. Uh, okay. So yeah. You, yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess, uh, Dr. Gubtekin is here. It, it, I am here. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it is a meningioma. Uh, this, the pictures are, I don't know, very fuzzy, but, uh, I can see the Samoma bodies and the uh, KH67 is low. Is this, let me see. Yeah. I'm not sure why it's so blurry. It's weird. Let me see. Let me see. I have my own pictures here yeah somehow they don't look so great but um do you i can share screen give me a second do 
Do you see it? Hello? Yeah, we can see it now. Yes. Okay. So uh, the, the two pictures on the left is one of the, them is the low power picture. The other is the high power picture. If you look at the high power, you can see the Samoma bodies and uniform uh, round to oval uh, low grade looking nuclei. Maybe some collagen in the background. The KH67 is really 1%, and a progesterone receptor is expressed in a, a significant number of uh, tumor cells. So, this is uh, to me run of the mill grade one meningioma. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, David, how would you how would you approach this case? David, uh, yeah. So in this case, I'd do a, a midline posterior approach, do a laminectomy, uh, midline dural. Uh, it's a little lateral, so you can do maybe an eccentric dural incision versus a midline incision, have an ultrasound, and then uh, resection tumor, have neuromonitoring available for pre and post. Awesome. Yeah. This so uh, on the CT scan uh, again, they didn't have the CT uploaded, but it was there was some calcification within the tumor. Um, so yeah, eccentric, open the dura eccentric to the left, uh, and you can see it adhered on the right. So just debulk what you can with the sauna pet and remove the calcifying fragment. And then because it's associated with the dura, try to bipolar the dura to get rid of as many, um, uh, tumor cells as possible. Uh, so just like, briefly about meningiomas, they account for about 25% of all intradural extramedullary tumors. Spinal meningiomas comprise about one to 10% of all meningiomas, the rest being uh, in the in the head, uh, the most commonly in the thoracic spine, about eighty two percent are uh, within the thoracic spine, fifty percent in the cervical, and then two percent at least is reported in the lumbar. High dose ionizing radiation in childhood is the most common risk factor for these meningiomas. Uh, they're more common in elderly patients with a peak age of sixty to seventy. Uh, they're more common in females with a ratio of four to one. Uh, but lumbar meningiomas are uh, about one to one ratio, equal between males and females. The most common initial presentation is local localized pain over you know kind of area in the spine. Uh, it can be seen in younger patients in the context of NF2, uh, and the patients with NF2 that develop these meningiomas have more aggressive histological subtypes than uh, you know, wild type uh, meningiomas. So most meningiomas are benign. Uh, about seventy to ninety percent are grade one. Uh, the subtypes are meningothelial, some moedas, fibroblastic secretory, uh, and as well as others. So the meningo but the meningothelial subtype specifically accounts for about 80% of all WHO grade one meningiomas, about five to twenty-five percent are grade two. Uh, these include uh, clear cell meningiomas, which typically arise from the dentate ligament, and about one to five percent are higher grade, grade three. So most spine uh, meningiomas are are intradural extramedullary. Uh, there are some that are uh, purely extradural, and these are typically more aggressive. Uh, and about 5% have both intradural and extradural components. Um, so after a complete excision of the meningioma, which of course you have to you know leave the dura in these cases, uh, the recurrence rate is seen at about 7%, uh, and most recurrence typically occurs four to 17 years after the initial surgery. Um, so as Dr. Uh, Gultekin mentioned, uh, the characteristic pathological uh, features are cells packed in these like fascicles, whorls, and uh, syncytia. Uh, they're associated with somoma bodies. Um, they have positivity for EMA and SSTR2 as well. And so that's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. This guy is pretty young, right? 30. Yeah, he was, uh, let me see. He was 33, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, one one remote possibility is that he may have NF2. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what you think about it, but yeah. it's rather unusual, I think, presentation. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. it, in I, age group. From what I remember, he didn't have any other uh, hallmarks of NF2, but I'll go back and take a look and see uh, okay. if there was anything else in the chart or he was being worked up for anything like that. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Thank you. That's That's it for neuropathology for today. For uh, case three, thanks again, Vic. For case three, the lady with the epidermoid, she did have a history 
of a sort of complicated um, epidural during pregnancy in Venezuela where she was bed bound for several days because of headache. So we think it was because of that. Uh, Hugh, maybe you can answer this question. Are lump are the spinal meningiomas histologically, you know, very different, you know, um, than the cranial ones? I, I guess the molecular classification, you know, in the cranial meningiomas, it's really changed a lot with this mark E1 and and some of these um, methylation markers. I'm just curious, you know, in terms of the spinal meningiomas, you know, we, you know, this a uh, Simpson grading, you know, doesn't necessarily apply. So I'm just curious what if there's a big difference there. Not necessarily. Spinal meningiomas are typically mm, more, I think, percentage of benign grade one meningiomas. A lot of samoma bodies in most of them, they do look like really low grade, long standing, you know, classic meningiomas most of the time. Um, occasionally, we do see clear cell meningiomas in the spine as, as alluded to earlier. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, a certain subtype of meningioma is overrepresented, especially in terms of molecular classification. Um, yeah, so as far as I know, there isn't much of a difference, but clear cell may be a little bit more uh, in the spinal cord. although. My institutional experience here has been such that clear cell meningiomas we see we we have been seeing more in the in the intracranial space, interestingly. But it may be a selection bias. Who knows what, why? You know. So the answer is, as far as I know, not a huge difference. Yeah, I, th I think also uh, just to comment on that, uh, Hume, is that the histopathology is not different, but I think the new methylation data that's coming out, there's they're able to kind of show these different subtypes in different locations, that, uh -huh. especially in cranial and spine. And then the other question what that came up with the last case was, you know, that younger ages uh, who present with meningiomas or, or schwannomas for that case, yeah, for the cranial side, typically if they if they present less than 30, with either a meninge or um, or a schwannoma, we'll do uh, we'll image the entire neural axis and then uh, send them to a geneticist for N of two testing. So uh, it's a good point. Okay, we do have a, a study, as you know, Michael, with uh, Dr. Carolina Benjamin to look at uh, uh, methylation pattern in in meningiomas and there's a medical student who helps with this. So it's gonna be an interesting study for the whole institution. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited about that. And it's a great collaboration with um, Toronto. Yes, exactly. Mike, have they done that in spinal meningiomas, the methylation clustering? It's maybe a good project for one of the residents. I haven't seen enough data. You know, I mean, I, I, with Carolina's project that we're working on, um, we're really trying to understand um, sensitivity to radiation and prediction of recurrence, uh, despite the WHO classification, because there's been data that shows that. So has that specific question kind of been looked at for spinal meningiomas. I've not seen that yet, but that'd be great to kind of start building that, that data set. But that's a real yeah. question, right? Is like, you know, after you remove it uh, and you, if you leave a little bit or you don't leave a little bit, you know, what do you tell these patients? How, how, how often do you follow up on their imaging? And if it is some atypia, uh, is this somebody that you should radiate early or should you wait for progression? Those are all kind of the questions and the clinical trials that are out there so far are, are still kind of uh, you know, borderline uh, useful, and but the methylation data that's been coming out has really been like 80, 90 percent kind of on on par with predicting these kinds of questions. So uh, it's going to be exciting to see how that plays out. Perfect. Pre-op. Um, 
Wow, that was a very impressive grand rounds already, neuropathology, and it seemed like it was all spine to me. Maybe I'm imagining things, but um, that's really quite impressive. And I love the fact that our uh, cranial colleagues have lots of commentary. I think it's a testament to what's going on in this institution. So um, great to see everybody on grand rounds. Very excited uh, to present. Howard asked me a couple of weeks ago if I could fill in for a spot. And um, I thought that'd be great. Uh, it gave me the chance to reconnect with everybody here, at least virtually. And um, I'll try not to take up too much time, like not like an hour and 10 minutes to get people out of here a little bit earlier. So um, I was wondering what I should talk about. And over the years, I've tried to give various different kinds of grand rounds that are a little bit maybe uh, different in their nature, something that could be uh, useful for people of all types. Um, whether you're a spine surgeon or not. But this is a talk I gave uh, last week. I saw a lot of the folks at Southern, which is a great name, one of the oldest societies in our field. And um, the topic I was assigned was a, kind of a scary one, which is how do you predict the future? How do you see what's coming in the next 25 years? And, and some of the panelists, uh, Adam Arthur, who's the new chair at Memphis, great guy, I talked about endovascular, um, Dr. Uh, Albert Kim, who was one of Josh Morkles' former fellows, talked about cranial and gave a really, really nice talk as well. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to share my slides. And the talk really is entitled um, The Future of Spine in the Next 15 Years. So hopefully you guys can see my slides. Um, so the idea here is that, wow, there's there's a lot that's happening in our field, right? And maybe you would say, well, why... <laughs> A lot of people probably in their showers right now are still in bed. Why give this talk or why even listen to it, right? And, and maybe I can't make the argument for this, but I would suggest and proffer that spine is very important. It is obviously economically the most important aspect, at least today, of neurosurgery until we can cure functional brain diseases in a, in a better way than what we're doing now. Spine is economically incredibly important. Um, most people who come to clinic with me have heard me say, and this, these are truths, that spine is the number two reason for an unplanned visit to a doctor in America. It is the number one cause of disability in this country. About three quarters, two thirds to three quarters of all disability in this country comes from the spine. That is also true in the third world. If you go to the Congo, or you go to um, you know Botswana, or you go to Delhi, the number one cause of disability, not death in the world is spine. And we know this because people try to set up a clinic for doing brain tumors in Africa and they end up doing all kinds of spine surgery mostly, right? Um, the human suffering is enormous. The, if you haven't had a spine problem, get ready. You probably will at some time. Uh, it may be very temporary, doesn't mean you need surgery, but it afflicts the vast, vast, vast majority of people. There's so much opportunity for improvement. Obviously we all need to improve uh, our reputation needs burnishing and technology and society are positioned. So you could make the argument, well, it would be nice to um, cure things like um, lack of high IQ, right? Or um, the ability to feel good about myself. Well, you know, are they even really at that point yet in technology and science? Is society ready for that? I don't know. I think society is ready for improvements in spine care. So let's take a look at the recent news. Just last week, you may have heard about Elon Musk uh, not being able to sleep enough because he's running three companies, whatever you think of Elon, and he starts talking about his back pain. And Elon, uh, some of you may know, has had a number of cervical surgeries. He talked his surgeon and forced the surgeon to do a cervical arthroplasty in Los Angeles and eventually had a fusion. Okay, uh, he was potentially going to be a speaker at the Double ANS this year. Um, he's he's a little bit overtaxed right now. I don't think he'll be at the Double ANS to, to lecture to us. Uh, this is Carson Daly. Carson went through a number of very experimental pain management style surgeries. It's in the news. If you follow this kind of stuff, I don't follow Carson Daly. He talks about, he ends up having a fusion. I'm not again trying to make the argument for fusion here. I'm just saying this is happening every day. And these are just the people who are out there talking about it, right? Adele, the bad sciatic, getting the best of her, right? Maybe that's why she had issues with Las Vegas with her show. Bottom line is it's in the news all the time. So, what do I think uh, the future is going to be? Well, we could go down so many different rabbit holes because spine is like that right now. Spine is a, is a, I would tell you, a more mature version of endovascular. I tell the endovascular people, they're the new spine, right? 
But there are so many areas that I'm going to try not to get all wonky with the technical pieces because, look, anybody can predict that, like, you know, rods that are made of, you know, magnesium that disappear in your body later. Wow, that's the future. Sure. I mean, maybe. Right. But let's talk about this more broadly. So first, I would say predictive analytics and big data. The second, of course, obviously, biologic therapies. The third is surgical orientation, visualization. The fourth is automation. Fifth is the risk of uh, risk amortization of surgery. Um, the sixth is cost reduction. And the last is how we train the future of spine surgeons. And I, I, there are many more that I could go on, but we're limited by time. So here's the caveat. These are three technologies that I have used, um, all initially planned to be major, major revolutionary uh, attempts to change spine care, and uh, to some degree have at least temporarily failed, right? So on the left, and these are all motion preservation devices. So on the left is a uh, arthroplasty, the, uh, which is the Charité disc, which was in use for 27 years in Europe before it came to America. Now it's essentially off the US market anyways. And there's, it's not because it was problematic. It just, there's a lot of reasons we could spend a whole hour and a half or day talking about that. Second is the TFAS trial, that's facet replacement. I was part of this when I was a young attending at USC. So facet arthroplasty. And the third is a PDN. It's, it's not spinology. People always think that's spinology. It's a PDN nucleus. It's a nuclear replacement, which has always been a holy grail, right? But this is the PDN device launched all over the world, eventually pulled back because of extrusions. So these are, these are really exciting areas that may come back in the future, right? But currently not the deal. So let's talk about the first area, which is predictive analytics and big data. So I was lucky enough to uh, co-edit this uh, issue of neurosurgical focus, looking at big data. And, you know, this is something we don't do. Now, what I'm not talking about here is do you track the ODI on your patients or do you do a press Caney score? What I'm talking about is big data, right? Big data plus metadata, right? So if you don't know much about data, hopefully Greg Basil's on and Greg can tell you more about big data and the data sets that we are now harvesting are really tremendous. And, and I've been pretty vocal about the issue of EMR and whether you like it or hate it, EMR is very expensive. Uh, each EMR system costs about $100 million. Uh, that's per hospital, right? So how many hospitals? About 3,000 hospitals in America. So the uh, Affordable Care Act was essentially an injection of trillions of dollars into uh, immature EMR systems, which are actually designed for billing. So these systems are primarily being used for billing purposes, but now what's happening is they own your data. And so as you're furiously clicking boxes and checking things off and signing things and typing into Epic or Cerner, doesn't matter, you're actually giving them all the information that they need to eventually make maybe one day uh, doctors obsolete, right? They own that data, right? So think about what that means. I'm not trying to be against EMR. EMR has a lot of advantages, but think about what that data means, right? Um, as Greg Basil will tell you, you know, these devices like Facebook are, 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 and TikTok are intended to get your data. They're really not about social sharing, even though it's used for that. It's really an attempt to get data out of you because you're the product or consumer or whatever. So let me show you how this works. So this is really impressive in a very, very basic granular element. So here is a slide I've been using since 2002 when I finished my fellowship training under Alan uh, Levy and Barth Green. And I was very fascinated and struck as our young attendings are by the actual course of recovery of patients. When you're a resident, you don't get to see all those time points. That is before surgery, right before surgery, during surgery, right after surgery, then a little bit later, then a lot later, and follow every single one of your patients. Hopefully, I hope you follow your patients through this journey and what they're going through. And the, the cost of the surgery is enormous for a lot of reasons. And by cost, I don't necessarily mean the cost like the financial cost, right? How much, how much it costs to pay for the operation and the nursing care and the meds. This cost can be measured socially, psychologically, um, societally. I tell people that, you know, uh, out of the surgeries I do every year, I probably generate four or five divorces a year. People are like, what is that? What are you talking about? And what I mean by that is the stress, uh, the emotional, physical, physiologic, social stress of going through an operation uh, is so intense that people's fabric, their psychosocial uh, fabric is disrupted temporarily. And that's enough to trigger a divorce. It's, it's a fact. I mean, if you don't believe it, you're not actually talking to your patients. You're just talking at them. So very important. Now, I used to say, well, this cost needs to be reduced, right? And that's a slide I used in 02, as I said. So now if I were to fast forward to uh, sometime more mid-career, I say, well, the cost of surgery, let's bend it. And I would tell people, well, 
we're going to do this through MIS. I don't try not to talk too much about MIS surgery, right? Because I love talking about it. I want to bend this down to something like background noise, right? Which is, you know, something that is less disturbing to the patient and their life. And that would be amazing. And that's the kind of slide I started to use in 2012, about a decade into my career. Now, what am I really saying here? I'm saying that I want to change the pattern of recovery or the pattern of disruption to something quite a departure from what's traditional surgery. Well, let me show you this. This is a slide from 2021. And John Yoon, uh, our former fellow who's now at Penn, uh, helped put this together. So these are two patients, uh, one who had undergone a decompression and the other one who underwent a fusion. And what you see here is the pattern of behavior of the patient is measured by physical activity on their smartphones. And this is a, a fingerprint. This is a phenotype of the patient's journey plus and minus 400 days of surgery. So that's 800 days, right? So several years. And you can see the surgical event for both people is disruptive, of course, because we part of it's iatrogenic. We tell people don't do anything, right? Or whatever. And you can see the recovery pattern, in fact, for the fusion is actually faster and better. And again, this is not intended, you know, as, as, as Shakespeare had said, you know, one uh, sparrow does not a summer make, right? It's not that I'm trying to show you an anecdote or case report. I'm trying to show you the power of this granular data to see things that cannot be measured by ODI. Just yesterday in clinic, I had a patient who was doing terrible years after surgery because of something else that happened. She's, I can't remember, it was a hip problem or whatever, SI joint. And she comes in and my, my uh, research coordinator comes running out and gives her an ODI like an ODI form. So Oswestry Disability Index. So guess what? That's gonna come down as a strike as Mike Wang's results are really crap. Because those events happen non-sprat, non-randomly, non right? They come to the clinic because they have a problem and it's close to two years. So let's get the data now. And she could be better by next week, but that data is captured now. ODI for that patient sucks. And it can go the other way. It could go that the patient is really happy about me, even though they're doing poorly or likes me and wants to make me feel better. So the gaps in delivery are important, right? So if you think about the journey a spine patient goes through the process of conservative care onto, you know, if they needed eventually a surgery and they, they all essentially have to kind of go through this to get to us, think about how disorganized that is and how we cannot predict when you have an acute disc herniation, are you gonna need surgery or not? If so, what kind of surgery? Now, look at this, chat GPT. I, I resisted putting a chat GPT part of this talk. I was like, you know what, I should really ask chat GPT, what is the future of spine surgery? And then it's going to spit something out and everybody's going to laugh and say, Mike Wang knows about chat GPT. It's so cool, right? I I'm not going to do that. And, and for those of you who are thinking about doing that in your next talk, go ahead. But likely someone else is already doing that as a slide in their talk. But look at this. This is a chiropractor who's talking about how chat GPT is going to revolutionize chiropractic treatment. So are we as spine surgeons such Neanderthals that the chiropractors are ahead of us. I'm just going to leave that for you to think about for a second. So what if we were able to synthesize data better? So right now you accrue decades of knowledge. So, you know, Dr. Levy or Dr. Green can look at a patient and very quickly size them up, figure out what they need and what the best route of action is. But what about things we don't see well? Subtleties, right? Like if we were looking at spec scans or we're looking at MRIs and CTs, how do we actually integrate that data? Not the radiology report, because that's useless. I'm talking about the detail, the granular aspects of imaging, right? Even down to things like, you know, segmentation abnormalities. And what if we were able to combine that data with the granular aspects, not the gross numbers of metrics of performance? And, and I just put an ODI up, for, for example, because it's the most used in spine. And what if we were able to synthesize, let's say amortize the information gleaned over a series of test injections, right? Maybe we could get to what's truly intelligent decision-making getting scary because it sounds like it might replace the decision-making of one of us. So the second part, biologic therapy. So this is a uh, well-played slide from about 20 years ago uh, of the, the Vacanti group in Boston, bioengineering and artificial ear, basically nude mouse, cartilaginous scaffold gets put under the, the nude mouse to grow cells onto this ear so it can be implanted onto the human body. This is, you know, this captured the imagination of Frankenflesh, all the things that people are scared of and also excited about growing organs in the body, uh, in the bodies of others, right? Not humans, maybe, or not you anyways, maybe a, a, a sibling of yours to give to you. And then what about disc um, replacement in a true sense, a biologic disc replacement so someone's cobbled together 
what looks like an annulus and 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 um, I'm sorry, uh, the, the the outer ring of the disc. I'll call it that, and the inner ring. So this is this is something that is like the holy grail. Now, we've entered this already, just so you know, because we take so much for granted. And I'm guessing I'm looking at the participants on this, and I'm guessing the average age of the people on this is probably like 29 or 30. So, um, you know, I was watching The Last of Us. Uh, last night, which is a great uh, dystopic future movie about a, it's based on a video game. And the people that were born or grow, grew up after a certain era, like after 9-11 or after the Great Depression, their view of the world's different. So I have to say this. We do have bioengineered proteins already, and it's BMP, right? Uh, infused, uh, common BMP, uh, human BMP2. I came out of UCLA. You saw Mark Hadley speak about it last uh, Saturday at the Picasa. Um, it's powerful. And, and you can argue about, you know, should we use BMP or not? That's a different conversation. It's a genetically engineered product that is grown by bacteria and sold to us commercially. It's actually truly amazing when you think about that leap. Forget about the politics and economics. That leap of what happened. Now, let me show you why I think it's important. Now, you guys are like, we use BMP every day, like causes problems, doesn't cause problems, whatever. Think about it differently. So here's an example of a case from, I think, 17 years ago of a German man who had a mandibular cancer and the jaw was completely resected and he was cured essentially, but he was left with no jaw, which is a kind of a problem. So what they did, the German doctors, is they made, they, they 3D printed a titanium scaffold and they, they stuck a bunch of BMP sponges in it. So they implanted it, you can see here under a scapula, you can see it there under a scapula. And then they removed it and guess what? It was full of bone. It had grown essentially something like a new jaw. They implanted, this is a true case, they implanted it into his mouth, in his skull, if you will. And he was chewing food normally six weeks later. Now, obviously they had to do more than that. They had put dentures on and all that. Think about, that's 17 years ago. What does that really mean for us? Now, I know the spine's not that simple. We can have a whole day conference on what it means to try to inject stem cells into the disc and does the disc uh, allow that population to live? And, and this has been, by the way, if you're out there thinking, oh yeah, let's just do that. This has been studied a lot. This is not, this is a trillion dollar proposition in terms of value, right? So let's talk about this. And I was so happy to hear our pathologists talk about collagen four. My goodness. I mean, that just elevated and made my day, even though I was rounding and looking around, but I, but I heard it collagen four in the blood vessels. And this is one of my favorite pimping items uh, it, when I do this in the OR, just to assess the depth of knowledge of our young trainees. What are the types of collagen that are important for us? And in the spine, I mean, obviously they're all important, but what ones should you know about? So you guys are yanking disc out of people's bodies every day. Do you even know what you're picking out? You know, I was really delighted to hear Ashish and Mike Ivan elevate the conversation about spinal meningiomas by bringing in the information that they had about cranial meningiomas. That's, that's an elevation, right? And so what collagens are important inside the human body for us? Well, we want to not sound like Neanderthals. You should know about this. So what about this type of collagen called collagen nine? Okay. And what does that mean for the human body? So collagen type nine can have as many genes defects, right? And it was described first back in 1937, which is multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, right? And it's one of these uh, inherited diseases that's autosomal dominant. Although it's mixed, it can be mixed in its, its behavior uh, genetically. And it, it leads to uh, problems with epiphyseal growth. So obviously manifest early on in a person's life, right? And there's actually knockout models for this. It's in the tryptophan uh, a polymorphism. So let me show you what that means, right? Because I'm not a geneticist. I'm not a molecular biologist. These are two studies, again, from a long time ago. This is a Japanese study where they looked at diverse lumbar pathologies and people undergoing surgery. And you can see that the wild type and mutant tryptophan allele, if you will, was associated heavily with spondylolisthesis. Now, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not a mono... Spondylolisthesis is not a monogenetic phenomenon in, these, in even these patients. But you can see that even in this small study, right, only 28% of the... Um, of, of, sorry, 
of the spondylolisthesis patients, right? So they're not just taking disc out of a lot of people, but the spondylolisthesis phenotype is associated heavily. You can see eight out of 10 with the tryptophan uh, mutation and only 28% in the wild type, if you will, right? Now, look here on the right. Here's a cross-sectional study from Finland. And why do we not do these studies in America, right? And maybe, maybe Carolina Benjamin will get on this, right? And, and, and so basically think about this, like they looked at obesity. Now the Finnish population is homogeneous largely compared to us genetically, which allows them to study traits like this. Like they're looking at obesity plus collagen nine defects. And they attribute 45 to 75% of all the findings from pathology in the spine to this one allele. And that's remarkable when you think about it. Now, why have we not gone further with this? Well, maybe people are doing this already in labs somewhere. Now, surgical orientation, and, and by the way, I'll let you think for yourselves about what that really means for the future of spine care, okay? So what about surgical orientation visualization? Well, let me ask you this. What do you guys use today as a visual aid? What do you use? You use the endoscope, like Greg Basil, you use the microscope, you know, like Dr. Levy, do you use an exoscope? Do you use loops, right? What are you guys using? But most of you are using some kind of a visual aid for a lot of your surgeries, okay? Now, I love this slide because it, you know, we're neurosurgeons. This is quite obvious that if you can't see, you can't operate. And the folks who operate with me hear the stories about my, the guy who waxes my car and how he's able to use other senses. And we encourage you to use all your senses, right? But ultimately surgical is largely a visual experience, at least for the trainee. And this just shows different kinds of uh, animals and the degree to which they have a visual acuity, right? And so humans are very, very visual. We obviously have the eyes on the front of our heads for depth perception and stereoscopic views as opposed to on the sides of our heads, like many animals. And, and that could be discussed with a, with a, with a veterinarian or, or animal uh, or zoologist or animal paleontologist or something like that. But the reality is we have to be able to see to operate. Now, what if we were to change that conversation? I know that Mike Guyvin's done some of this work, Bobby Stark as well, looking at how we enhance visualization inside the human body. Well, mostly using fluorescence, right, inside the human brain, right? But what about changing our field of view? What about changing our ability to understand the visual spectrum? What about our ability to understand texturization? right? These are really, really critical pieces of how we can get better at surgery. So for example, could we see things before they arrive? Can we see around corners? And this is just a short video of Telogen, which we have now. We're the second center in America, um, third in the world. The first case was actually done by a former fellow of ours, Marcus Ling in Singapore. Uh, and um, you can see that it changes your view of things. It's different it, in its nature. It's different uh, and requires adaptation in terms of what a person will have to be able to do to use and harness this aid. Just like when people first started using the operating microscope, things had to be quite different in terms of, of what's happening. And, and I'll let you guys mull about what, what that really means. Automation, very important. Um, no matter what you think about, and I've, uh, Shelby Burks came up and he was telling me what he thought about uh, the robot and Timmer's obviously becoming a fast expert in this, doing cases first and man all the time. Um, what does automation really mean for us? So a lot of people think, well, the robot's a device for putting a pedicle screw in, or, or maybe in about three years for taking off the lamina, right? But what does it really mean? And I like to show this slide because this is from the automotive industry. This is exobionics. You can see a gentleman standing underneath the car on an assembly line. He's got to put stuff underneath the car. And you can imagine if someone had to hold their arms up like this eight hours a day, how long that lifespan is for that human being as a worker, as an auto worker. Will automation allow us to have less occupational hazard, extend our career lifespan, help us perform better, faster, more accurately, and all that? And so here's an example. So this is this is not automation per se. This goes along with visualization, but this is augmented reality. We have the Augmetic system. We're the first in the state of Florida. We had probably one of the first uh, 10 or 15 systems in the world um, with the heads-up display. We wear these heads-up displays and we have guidance. It's quite bulky right now. This is Gen 2. Gen 3 will obviously get smaller and smaller and everybody will say, oh, why don't you use Google Glass? And obviously, duh, that's where this is all headed. Uh, like many biotech companies, this is based out of Israel. Uh, the Israelis are absolutely fantastically innovative, maybe only beat by Silicon Valley in terms of the degree and speed of innovation and, and translation. But you can see that this kind of thing becomes very powerful. Obviously, uh, they wanted this device in our hands because they're looking at the possibilities for this in, uh, in brain surgery, right? Because we are a big brain surgery center as well. And what about a robotic drilling? So here's Roberto Perez Roman. 
using the Mazor X with Stealth Edition to do endoscopic robotic drilling, right? So this allows uh, Roberto to know exactly where he is without using x-ray or even looking at the patient and then drilling on a stationary stable apparatus so that he can't bottom out and, and not that he would, but can't bottom out and hurt the patient or get into the fecal sac, right? Amortization of risk. Now, many of you, uh, who, uh, I'm doing my MBA now, so it's very exciting, but I've always been interested in this concept of amortization because um, until we have a time machine, this is very, very important. So the idea is that um, how do you apportion risk, right? And this is a very interesting concept that we are not accustomed to. We are very much accustomed culturally as surgeons to the idea that there's an event. That event is a surgery, right? So in other words, patient comes to you, do I need the surgery or not today, right? Um, what is the surgery going to be? What is the recovery after the operation? And so what it tends to do, it tends to lead to a natural first binary element of decision-making. In other words, I've decided what surgery this patient needs. Is the patient going to sign on the dotted line, pay the money? Is the insurance going to cover it? It's a highly binary mode of thinking that actually most industries do not partake in this type of model. It's really quite interesting, right? How that happens. And then we tend to define the event as the critical event, and then thereafter, there's no association, right? In other words, you know, this is a real plague of the spine surgeon, which is how many times have you seen a person in clinic who had a surgery, it didn't go well, or the result was not what was expected, and the patient goes, well, I, and I'll ask, why, why don't you go back and see Dr. Smith? And they'll say, well, he doesn't take my insurance anymore like what? Like they took your insurance for the surgery, didn't they? And now they don't take your insurance. So how do you apportion that risk? So we know most diseases in spine are degenerative and most of them occur over a period of time, at least in their natural evolution. So this is a uh, awake fusion. This is Joanna Gernsbach, uh, first case in 2013. You can see I'm talking to the patient and we're going to, we're going to do this fusion with inner body cages, screws and all that. And really, really, you can argue back and forth about whether this is a good idea, bad idea, revolutionary, you know, what, what it does, what it doesn't do. That's not the point of this discussion. The point of the matter is after this surgery, it's very common for people to have symptoms of pain and very, very it's very different from a standard operation, right? So here's an example of how this might change things. And I'm not talking about the awake fusion changing things. I'm showing you here now three level awake MIST lift, right? Now you can make an argument about whether you think that's a real deformity or not a real deformity. That's not really the point of what I'm trying to get at here. The point of it is that we're, we are entering an era where we used to think that the MIS surgeries were for young, healthy athletes, and even if you read the news now, it's still being proffered in that way. But the reality is that the MIS surgery is most powerful when it's in the sickest, the most, um, the most difficult, the most morbidly sick people like transplant patients and the obese and the elderly and osteoporotics. This is where the, the rubber really meets the road. And, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm tending to want to drift off in that rabbit hole, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to resist because... This is an important concept as regards to amortization of risk. So this is a collection of papers. Again, you see here, Roberto Perez-Roman, Vignesh Kumar, Greg Basil. This is a center that uh, hopefully under, uh, continuing under uh, Alan Levy's charge that we will be the innovators of the world, right? So this is the endoscopic ALL release. I showed this at the last grand rounds. This is not to be trifled with. The importance of this is likely going to be uh, quite substantial. So here you can see the kerosene going. I think that's Roberto doing that uh, cadaveric model for ALL release from the back endoscopically. Okay, so what does that mean? Why even bother with this, right? First of all, less RVUs, right? That's the problem. Less RVUs, so nobody wants to do that yet until the crisis, and then everybody's out of a job, and then we'll still be thriving here in Miami. So what if you could do this kind of thing without general anesthesia? What if you could do it over a series of surgeries over a period of time? Now, a good friend of mine, Tony Tenori who's in Boston used to say, Mike, when a person comes to you for surgery, okay, the thing to do is not to try to make them perfect. You're never going to make them perfect because surgery doesn't do that. What they want to be is they want to be one day younger than when the things got really bad. And, and you hear this in the clinic. It's really boring to me that people say, you don't know how active I used to be. My, my very flippant answer is everybody was fine until they weren't fine, right? Until you died or had a heart attack or got cancer. That's, 
that's they're saying nothing to us. But they are saying one thing, which is that if I could just go back to May 4th of 2021, I, I could live with that, right? So what if we could change things enough? And so this is a, a paper by Greg and JP <coughs> and Colson uh, looking at the modularization of implants. And so let me show you what that means to me. So here's that case I showed you. And you think about it, and I, I love, those of you who come to clinic with me, you know I love dentists. I love talking to dentists. And you think about what orthodontists do, right? You, I don't think anybody here who has kids is afraid that their child might need braces. It's not like a fear thing, right? Uh, but if I told you your daughter needed a uh, T10 of pelvis, you'd probably go crazy. You'd probably flip out. Probably wouldn't be able to sleep for a month, right? Well, why is that? Well, because if you look at it, the orthodontists, they don't do what we do. The equivalent of what we do is, is I would say to uh, Dr. Levy, hey, listen, Jessica, she needs this fix. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna knock all of her teeth out, right? And I'm gonna put in 32 perfect implants and she's gonna look beautiful. And he would be like, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? And that's actually what we're telling people. We're saying, when I slice her back open, I'm going to take out a ton of bone. We're probably going to tear something, maybe a nerve root. Um, we're going to um, lose about four liters of blood. And then we're going to stitch it back together after we implant a ton of metal in your back and a bunch of, you know, recombinant BMP and bone from your hip or whatever. And then you're going to sit in the hospital for a week and you're going to be pain for a year. And then afterwards, you won't be able to move your back. That's actually what they're hearing, right? What if we change things so that we did the surgery in a sequence of six surgeries over time to allow the human body to adapt, right? What if I lost 80 cc's six times? That's very different, right? Because there are irreversible steps of morbidity and even mortality. Now, of course, none of this can be discussed without some, some issue of cost, right? And probably the most important and needed advance in our field and zero motivation, really. There is, there is motivation from hospitals that ask us to reduce our cost, but the point is to increase their profitability. So nobody is really talking about what it costs to fix people. They're, they're really not. I mean, it's just not a thing yet. And I will tell you, this is we're, we're in danger because this is where the right and left wing politicians are completely aligned. So, you know, whether you like or hate the Affordable Care Act, that was from the left, um, the, the, the aspects of insurance um, um, evolution on the right are in some ways almost more draconian, right? Which is that they don't like the fact that we have to operate on people to fix them because that costs money too, on the other side, to business and industry, right? So here's a slide I love to talk about. Uh, because almost nobody's heard of it, except maybe Greg. Uh, this is called Baumol's cost disease. This is a very important concept. And if you don't understand this slide, then you don't understand why when you talk to people who are outside of medicine, they don't understand you and you don't understand them. And if you look at it, the whole world has gotten more efficient, better, cheaper, right? Think about how many people in Africa have a cell phone now. I'm not saying a, a smartphone necessarily, but a cell phone. They do all their transactions on their cell phone. I mean, that advance, when you think about it, like when I was growing up, people were starving in Ethiopia. And we were trying to, you know, send money to UNICEF because, you know, a million babies were dying. Now everybody's got a, a cell phone, right? They're like zelling or I don't know what they use, but they're, they're sending money to each other. They don't carry a wallet. That's the nature of radical change. And think about college tuition, right? We work at a university and medical care. It's gone the other direction. I'm not indicting the U.S. healthcare system. Everybody knows that I love the U.S. healthcare system. I believe it is the number one healthcare system in the world, period. And I'll debate every single economist on that because my perspective is different, that we innovate for the world and the rest of the world just borrows from us, right? So we are subsidizing the world in a lot of ways, whether it's drug development, whether it's surgery, it doesn't matter, right? We're doing the bulk of the, the lion's share of the heavy lifting, not only on the innovation, but also the market actualization and the studies and demonstration of efficacy and the learning, right? So that costs a lot of money, but you can't get around this equation, which is that when businesses and governments look at us, they're like, what's wrong with you guys? You need to be regulated. So this is an iPad too. So this is the cost of computing power in a $200 iPad 2 or iPad 3, doesn't even matter. And look at those numbers. I mean, this is, if you go back just to 1980, right? The cost of computing power for an iPad 2 is $100 million, okay? Think about what that means. Now, you say, well, no, 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 we're getting better. And I would, I would tell you that it's pretty obvious that I pride myself on efficiency, right? I pride myself on efficacy, efficiency, and the economic proposition of what I do. And, and I don't necessarily mean dollars. I mean, economic proposition of what it, what it takes to get from A to Z. So 
if you ask me to be perfectly level with you and say, Mike Wang, let me ask you, compared to 2002, when you left Miami and went back to USC, how much better are you? Better meaning like efficient in terms of speed, efficacy in terms of outcome, cost, productivity, et cetera, okay? And, and believe me, I, I, everybody knows me, knows that productivity in some ways is, is not productivity for money, productivity to take care of humans, right? So you can say, well, I did 100 cases here, that's amazing. If I did 400, I helped technically maybe four times as many people as you. I cured four times as many people. I saved four times as many, right? So it's not about, I don't want to give the wrong impression to res. It's not about reps. I hate that term. It's not about reps. We're here to provide a service to the community. If your service level is 100 cases and mine is 400, I'm providing 4X service level to you. Assuming all the conditions are equal, right? Of course, assuming quality, assuming outcome, assuming uh, satisfaction and, and all that is equal, right? But the reality is you understand what I'm saying, right? Now, Probably I'm four to six X what I was when I was like Greg, right? That's pretty good. That's actually better than probably 99% of surgeons out there, I'm guessing. And then it's not a point of arrogance. It's, it's a fact, right? But it's not 10 X. It's not 100 X. It's not 1000 X. It's not 1 million X for sure. And that took me 22 years to, to get to that point. So these are the threats to what we are, right? The existential threats. Um, and, and we may find that spine isn't going to be what it, is today. And let me show you why. This is a paper by Clint Devon. Clint unfortunately died flying his own airplane. So be careful if you're out there flying. Doctors are the number one group of pilots to die and hurt other people. Clint Devon died uh, in Colorado. Uh, but this is his paper showing the surgeons in his hospital. And you can see, yeah, there's some surgeons who do a couple surgeries to make money, like six for the year. And then there's one really high volume guy and three sort of medium people, right? What does that look like? Well, that looks like this. So this is the cost of their surgeries, 90 day cost, right? So global cost, if you will, for that event. And you can see some people have a very narrow band. In other words, they're very good at doing the same thing over and over again. Some people have a very wide band. Some people are high cost and people are low cost, right? This variability is what business hates. The business model hates variability, they like the plan ahead. And it's a real problem for us. Okay. Now, I'm going to go on a little sidebar here because we've had some conversations about this recently. And Sumed Shah gave a very nice talk about uh, the RVU, okay, the, the evil RVU. RVU is just a representation of, of productivity, right? And what that really means, not about the RVU. But look at this. This is the AMA House of Delegates, right? So this shows you the delegates. There's about 594 delegates. Um, and if you ever want to be an AMA, AMA House of Delegates, uh, you've got to work your way up there. And I know Turkey Eller Johnny's approached me about this. This is an amazing career. It's all done on your free time. So it comes out of time for your family and money out of your pocket in a way. But the reality is it's an amazing journey. And I want to show you what this looks like. So surgery globally makes up a, a, between one fifth and one quarter of the AMA House of Delegates. So that's the voice of surgery, including ENT, urology, general surgery, cardiac surgery, all that together. Okay. So this is the uh, percentage of physicians that are surgeons, right? So already surgery is punching above its weight in a way, right? Now, if you think about it, okay, this has some implications, okay? So it protects us, okay? So these are uh, surgery uh, delegations, the specialty society delegations, right? Here's the surgery delegations, right? Um, this is specialty society, right? And so you see the representation still standing at, at about a quarter, right? Now, why does this matter? You're like, what is Wang talking about? I don't get it. This is um, from uh, Lou Toomey Allen, John Ratliff, and Joe Chang, looking at the anatomy of the 63047 and 22633 uh, code, the code and the decompression code. This is, this is, uh, this is lots of money. This is lots of our views. It's lots of money, uh, whether it's coming to you or it's not coming to you. It's all getting worked out inside the AMA House of Delegates. Okay. And again, I'm not taking a side on this other than I think that spine surgery needs to be valued heavily because spine surgery is risky, dangerous. Uh, we are the, we have the, I think we have the hardest job in medicine, a spine surgeon does. And, and, and it, the interesting statistic is if there's a cert, if there's a doctor that's killed by a patient, the most likely specialty is going to be spine surgery. So just for the brain guys who think it's easy just to whack people with, with screws and stuff. It's not like that. It is a very, very, very hard life if you want to take it seriously. So look at this now. This is looking at seats in AMA House of Delegates, right? So double AOS, which represents all the orthopedics, has one seat in the House of Delegates. Double ANS has one seat. Um, AOA, the American Orthopedic Association, has one seat. 
The CNS has one seat. So people argue about the one versus two societies. This is one of the reasons not to have a one neurosurgery. I know you guys are like, no, oh, I don't want to pay dues to both. Guess what? That's a second seat, doubles representation. The AANS and CNS are represented by the spine section, the meetings in Miami next month. So the spine section essentially controls this aspect of AANS, CNS. And then ISAS has a seat, right? ISAS has a seat as well. And NAS, so the ISAS meetings in San Francisco and in June, people don't care about ISAS, but it has a seat equal to the double AOS, right? Which is gigantic. And NAS, we question whether NAS is really on our side because they incorporate pain management and physiatry now. So this is this is how power politics are done. This is how the sausage is made. This is how it's decided what you are worth in a way, in a way. But well, how do we define worth? So this is important because one of the great things Harvey Cushing did was he didn't get down this rabbit hole of, of what I've been talking about for the last five minutes. He said, we need the global concept of what the neurosurgeon is what the neurosurgeon means, what the neurosurgeon represents. And you see that paying dividends to you every day when you open your mouth and say you're a neurosurgeon or you give someone a card or someone hears about you, what is that worth and what is that value? And how do we preserve it? Because it's at risk of being lost. And this is a key part of, of the cost of surgery and the value of the surgeon, right? So are we worth more, right? So economically compared to who, right? Compared to LeBron James, I mean, I'd argue that everybody I'm talking to right now is worth more than LeBron James because he doesn't do anything important, right? You guys do. You guys save lives and save limbs and save, save vision, right? You don't put a ball through a hole, right? So how is healthcare bought and paid for, right? So I'm going to always stand on high and say, look, we do important economic work. Societally, how do we decide this distribution of resources, right? How do we figure out what someone's worth and what society should value? That's important. Think about that every time you're out there. Scientifically, who brings the research and innovation, right? Well, we do. Look at this, look at this chart, looking at NIH funding by departments. Look at neurosurgery, right? My God, right? Of course, that's part of the vision and the importance of the brain, of the human brain. So let's ask some experts why it is that we're so valuable, right? So I, I did this and Rick's gonna like this. Rick Comedar's gonna like this because I went to his mentors and this is from a couple of years ago, I apologize. I used this in Grand Rounds a number of years ago. I went to Bob Solomon, chair, the, for, uh, the chair at Columbia, former chair, I should say, Sanders now the chair. And I asked him, why why are we worth more or valued more? He goes, he goes, neurosurgeons aren't that valuable. They have less impact on the public health than sanitation workers. And you know what, Bob, you're right. You know, you're absolutely right. Maybe it's just in our head. Maybe maybe we should all just take up garbage collecting instead because they're more valuable. Well, uh, that's one way to look at it. So then I went to Jeff Bruce, who who uh, is one of uh, Rick mentors, uh, Rick's mentors. And uh, and he said, well, that's true. Uh, we are a small proportion, only 1% of doctors, but we touch so many lives as a profession. And the depth and the profundity with which that interaction occurs is the issue, right? And so... I asked Ian McCutcheon, right, from the industry, he goes, he goes, no, no, Mike, 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 uh, you know, just right. And that's why almost every adult, you know, almost every adult, just try try this experiment, ask them if they know of some impact of neurosurgery. Okay. And then I want you to ask the same question a different way, maybe ask them, and again, I have to be careful who I indict, right? But ask them, you know, if they've had the same kind of effect with something like another field. Okay, just pick one, just pick one at random, okay? And, and see what the impact is, right? That, that is so profound that everybody has some interaction with us, even though there's only, you know, four or 5,000 of us. Now, the last part is about the training. Now, this is an interesting concept, right? Because what does this mean in the world of endovascular, for example? What does this mean in the world of spine? And of course, the training is important because it's the future of our profession, it's the future of our societies, it's the future of who we identify as. So if we train a bunch of losers, right, in 30 years, neurosurgeons will be losers, essentially, right? So that's why your attendings are trying to get you to be better. And uh, some of the medical students that are listening don't understand this yet. They understand it implicitly because they want to do this field. But certainly, most medical students do not understand this yet. And most residents don't either. But the idea is this is an orthopedic hand and a neurosurgery hand, and we have the smaller hand. So I'm gonna talk about ortho neuro because this issue of spine training is important. So um, let's see if this will play. Oh, why won't it play? Oh, that's so odd. Anyhow, this is, um, oh, it's okay. 
the, on the right is Jacques Morcos clipping an Anderson. Okay. So the elegance of it, I don't know why this won't play. It's so weird. Um, but on the left is an orthopedic surgeon malleting, and it's actually a very funny video, a uh, malleting with incredible uh, enthusiasm and almost uh, laughably uh, with, uh, with so much force on an IM nail. Okay. And the, the question is, are, can we even be like, associated this guy's like smashing into somebody's body with a hammer and Jacques Marcos is delicately dissecting the arachnoidal planes off of uh, I don't know which nerve that is Jacques it's it's one of the nerves and cranial nerves right so let's think about that for a second and what does it mean to be orthopedic across from neurosurgery across the aisle in terms of spine right so this is a concept of um the uh satisfaction of burnout in uh U.S. physicians right so Let's look at this. So this is the mean burnout, um, percent burning out, right? So 45% of doctors state they're burning out, right? And uh, take a look here, orthopedic surgery. Wow, how is it possible? Orthopedists are among the highest paid and they have a great lifestyle and they're higher than average for burnout. Why is that? Is it, how does that happen, right? And then look here, neurosurgery, about equal distant from the mean on the other side. What is that? What is that saying about what it is that we do and what they do? And then granted, a lot of neurosurgeons do no spine and a lot of ortho, most orthopedists do no spine. But think about that in terms of the, the phylogeny of, of, of how they've developed in their training. Their training program is orthopedic. Our training program is neurosurgery, right? So think about that and think about what that means. And I, I like to show this slide and I like to show it to a lot of people because this was given to me by Bob Harbaugh. And it is a uh, slide from... Uh, um, archives of internal medicine. And this shows a number of specialties in uh, medicine across a XY two by a grid. And this is on the Y axis satisfaction with work-life balance. And the uh, X axis is burnout. So obviously if you're very far to the right, you're getting burned out a lot. If you're very high on the Y axis, then you're very satisfied. And as you can see by and large, um, people fall along this regression line, which is to say that the people who have a good work-life balance they are not going to burn out, right? This is the mundane kind of thing like, oh, people who smoke are obese and poor do poorly. Yeah, good. That doesn't help me, right? It's really not that meaningful, right? But actually, I will challenge you. Take a look here. If you see what's going on, you have orthopedic surgery falling right here on the regression line, maybe a little bit better than, than average, right? But a lot of burnout. And then look at neurosurgery way down here at the far out line. Look at that. That means that we have a crappy work-life balance, but very low burn. I'm not, and I, if anybody's burning out, I apologize. I don't mean to suggest you can't burn out. What I'm saying is that it just doesn't seem to happen as much with us, right? That's the reality. And that's to say, that's not a neurosurgery paper. So think about us and our orthopedic colleagues. And the reason I'm talking about this is because there is a call for a spine residency, meaning that spine will break off from neurosurgery and orthopedics and become its own residency, its own specialty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Neurosurgeons, we tend to be hospital. And again, I know that there are neurosurgeons that take the orthopedic model and they just want to make money and own a physical therapy clinic and MRI, do disability work. I'm talking about classically. Hospital focused, take lots of call. Even in spine, we love taking call, right? We really do. Those are cases. We want the cases. We treat sick patients. We used to pride ourselves in taking care of the ICU. It's really kind of sad that we've gotten away from that because that was one of the reasons I went into neurosurgery. I want to run the ICU. I want to run my ICU with my patients. And that's how we were trained. And neurosurgeons for a long time were the only doctors that automatically became ICU intensivist certified capable and able to run ICUs just by doing the residency. It, it really was a thing. Now you could say it's changed now, but that's a huge deal to lose that. We enjoy new technologies by anecdote. We don't wait for the randomized prospective trial to do something new. And you can see that in the, in the vascular world, obviously, right? Okay. Orthopedics in spine anyways, they're parts of big multi-specialty group practices, meaning hand, shoulder, hip and knee, you know, oncology, pediatrics plus spine as a spinoff. Uh, and they usually get the referrals from their partner. So your hip guys see some spine problem, they send it to you. The general orthopedist sees some back pain, they send it to you. They try to generate a lot of passive income because they're burning out, right? They want to get the passive income. Like, how do I get more money? But I don't want to take call. I don't want to come in the hospital. I don't want to run ICU. I don't even want to do that much surgery. I just need to generate income. And they are very focused on sort of evidence-based. I'm not saying they practice this way, but they were the ones, uh, Mark was wrong about this in his talk. 
they were the ones who started the examination of your practice. We borrowed that largely from, I believe, from orthopedics because the orthopedists had the collection period. They started that. So the orthopedists in their collection period are super nervous. And then they get actually asked all these questions about what cases they did in their first couple of years because they, they were very worried about what neurosurgeons are now just talking about. So look at this. This is a paper from Frank Lamarca. This paper is from 2006 or seven. Uh, and, and the data from 03, take a look at this, right? This is the proportion of the surgery being done by neurosurgeons, okay? As opposed to, of course, obviously orthopedists. At that point in 2003, we had already surpassed them. Right now, the, if you take the number of surgeries being done, thoracolumbar, we do over 65% of the surgery, okay? Forget about cervical. Cervical, duh, it's like a foregone conclusion. We are, we've taken over the field. Now look at this, Martin Pham, USC grad, he's at UCSD. This is a paper with Larry Lenke, okay? I, I couldn't get his slides, I didn't ask him for it, but I took a picture of this at the CNS a couple years ago. This is the uh, rate of fusion and decompression, okay? So look at what's happening, right? This is showing the changes that are happening, okay? In terms of the neurosurgeons doing more and more complicated cases, okay? Now here is the key data, okay? So the average number of spine surgery procedures performed during the 10 year period was 433.8 for neurosurgery residents and 119, sounds high to me. It really sounds, honestly sounds way too high. I think it's wrong. But uh, you guys, Astro Orthopedic Chief Residents, how many cases of spine did they do in their residency? My guess is more like 20. So neurosurgeons saw an increase by 26.5% in their, in their experience. This is from 389 to 492. Whereas procedures with orthopedic residents saw a decrease of 41.3% from 141 to 82.3 procedures. Wow. If I was an economist, I would say there is something going on here. This is a serious thing that's happening. Now, look at this, surgeon specialty and outcomes. Okay, look at this, right? So this is looking, I think this NS Quip data. Um, this is looking at the outcomes and guess what? Uh, we, we lose less blood, right? We have less complications, right? Um, all of those are realities. And I'm not saying that we are better, but look at this. This is really... This is the shot across the bow. This is the sentinel marker of what is happening to our world. This is a, a fellowship that is being proffered in New York City, a very well-known one by orthopedic surgeons. And what they're asking is, and I'll just read it to you if you're on your phone, you can't read it. Candidates who apply to this fellowship, this is for spine fellowship from orthopedics, will already have completed a residency in orthopedic surgery or neurosurgery, as well as a fellowship in pediatrics or spine surgery. Okay, what that means is we'll only take you for fellowship if you've already done a fellowship. And they're speaking only to the orthopedists. The neurosurgeons don't have to do that. What is that saying about our colleagues across the aisle? And should we be putting the hand down, outstretched to help them? Should we be partnering with them at this time in their, in their evolution? Should we just speed past? What is the answer? And I, I don't have the answer, but I think it's a very interesting question. Obviously, we'll have a huge impact on anybody with any interest in spine or neurosurgery, right? So in conclusion, spine surgery has a super bright future. We are very unlikely to be replaced by stem cell injections, APP, the AI, robots, or anything like that anytime soon. There's so much need in our field, the number of patients that need our help, the spectrum of pathologies, that we, some of which we don't even try to address now, the severity of suffering, all this mandates the new advances. I'm very excited that we have all these young surgeons, like and I'll, call, I'll put Timmer in the group, uh, Timmer and Shelby and Greg and Ian and, and now Matthew. Um, who knows what the future is going to bring, but we should be moving in the direction of better diagnostics, ethical decision-making, and safer and more effective surgery. So uh, with that, I'll finish ahead of time and under schedule. Uh, I'll stop sharing and get let you guys get on to the OR. But um, Howard, thank you for letting me jump in on this open slot for Grand Rounds. I uh, hope somebody uh, learned something uh, during this talk. Happy to take any questions, comments, uh, uh, Rotten Tomatoes, whatever anybody wants. Okay, thank you.
Like a- Great job, Mike. You always get me excited about doing spine. Thanks, Alan. I'm waiting for a question from Ashish. Usually Ashish jump in. It's almost nine, so I know if it's in the OR, but Ashish, would you ask? He's the only one that'll ask a question during a spine session. That's not a spine <laughs> I was just talking about uh, asking, I was telling Evan he's going to ask some questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were just talking, but that was a great talk. Um, no, I think it's, 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 I think spine has innovated a lot more than cranial in the last, you know, 25 years. In terms of if you look at the instruments we have in cranial neurosurgery versus spine, I was I'm always fascinated, and I think a lot of that is because of, you know, the um, industry has has propelled I think spine a lot more in that sense. And um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are in the dichotomy between the two. Yeah, it's it is. Ashish, that's a good point, but I would suggest it's actually your the problem is that it's like waiting for your flying car, right? It's like, you know, this is the, this is, if I could talk to the young people, because I'm getting quite old, I just turned 52. And for the young people, the, the medical students, especially, like, you can't wait for the thing to arrive, right? So if you just see the end product being delivered to you by, you know, Medtronic or whatever, yeah, that was a long journey to get from BMP in 1962 with Marshall Urist boiling down cow bone, like tons of cow bone to find BMP. And now when we just pull it off the shelf. Cranial, I mean, my God, if I think about the diseases that cranial surgery could fix, my goodness. I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's shocking in the least. Bobby Stark is just texting me now. And I'll tell you, I love Bobby because Bobby's always doing the new stuff. And, you know, if I were a young surgeon today and I wasn't afraid of being up all night, every night, I, I think endovascular would be where I would go because, they, you know, what they're about to do with, um, I mean, I don't want to see surpassing the functional people, but what they're trying to do to functionally change the brain by using the, the vascular highway and road network to the brain, to the, to the hard to get to parts of the brain, that's next level stuff. Whether it's just the getting there, how do you get to this part of the thalamus, which vessel you're going to go through? I mean, you start to think about it, right? It, 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 it almost boggles the mind. Spine really starts to look quite pedestrian in some ways. The thing that we love about spine is that it is very unlikely that someone's going to surpass us. And let me go into that issue of the disc. And, and the disc is a hostile environment. You think you can inject some cells in there that are going to live with zero blood supply and zero oxygen for, you know, whatever years and multiply, you, you're crazy. A cancer, maybe, maybe a can- cancer doesn't even want to go to the disc, right? What disc related cancers are there? Think about that. It is not an easy problem to crack. And so I think because people present late and actually it might work to our advantage, people are afraid of surgery. There will be spine surgeries my, in all likelihood for the next 40 years until we have a real spine replacement. But I, I don't think it's that we're more innovative. I think that the technology wasn't quite there yet for you guys, although I'm starting to see it. It's super cool, whether it's high, uh, you know, high and low foo ultrasound, um, you know, super cool stuff that you guys are doing every day. Uh, And I think if I could encourage the spine surgeons, don't get on your laurels. You need to be thinking investigatively, mechanistically, uh, like Ashish does. Like, like, don't, don't think like, Timmer says it all the time, like if we're putting pedicle screws in in 15 years, we failed. Um, but the, the lack of imagination in our field is a problem today. Did Evan have, Evan, I want to hear from Evan too. She, he said he's going to ask the questions, right? Yeah, I, I thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, no, we were just uh, talking briefly about, uh, again, like the innovation. I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think especially in the last you know, 10 to 15 years since all the, the positive uh, thrombectomy trials came out. There's so much now, you know, push for innovation in endovascular. But I guess I, to, to Ashish's point too, is that, you know, with the, my, my thought is that, that a lot of with the open surgery, you know, whether that be skull-based, open vascular or tumor surgery, there's, there's limited innovation. And you see some of it in, in, I think the realm of really glioma surgery, right. With 5-ALA and things that are being pushed in that direction. But do you, do you, uh, it's hard for me to, to see where it goes in, in the other directions. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like with, you know, the fear I always have for the, for the um, intrinsic tumors of the brain, right? It's not a fear. I mean, it's, it's a hope it really, but fear I have for the surgeons, the hope we have for the patient is that it will be a medical treatment, right? A vaccine, chemotherapy, something like that. And then the whole field will basically disappear in a, in a way, in a way. 
And then maybe the tumor surgeons will become the new functional surgeons. I mean, we've seen this happen in other fields. I would suggest that if you're a tumor surgeon, the days of using a spoon to remove the tumor <laughs> Right. I think I think you, I think we need to think differently. Like if, if I were to like if I woke up tomorrow, like in, in a movie and I was a, suddenly a brain tumor surgeon, like a like a glioma surgeon, I would say, wow, OK. Um, how am I going to change things? And I think you see that with what Rick and Jock and and and, you know, Mike Ivan are doing, which is they're looking at it from a different lens, which is how do we use the tumor surgery as a way to learn about the brain as well? rather than just le learning about the tumor, right? So we, the residents always hear the talk about the tumor, which is we took the tumor out and this is the tumor. But to me, the more interesting question is what about the brain? And you hear that in the minds of the tumor surgeons only when, Evan, when you're out having a dinner or drink with them. But when they have to give a structured talk, you rarely hear it except for if it gets a tagline like connectnomics or, you know, whatever, track mapping or, so, you know, like that's fairly pedestrian. But if you really think about what tumor surgeons are doing, maybe you would call it, a, a coin a new especially eloquent brain surgery or something like that, right? That would be really, really cool um, for a career like someone like you, if you're doing endovascular and tumor, and you're like, wow, we, are, we, we operate on the eloquent parts. You guys operate on the non-eloquent parts. So guess which one's more important? But it, there's so much to do, the work. I mean, like, how can anybody sleep at night, right? Like, there's too much to solve, too many problems to solve. That's great. I mean, I, I, I feel bad for like the plastic surgeons or, I mean, urologists or whatever, like their fields are so limited compared to ours. Fair enough. Thank you. Dr. Wang, it's Kat. I, I have a question. I liked your um, analogy to orthodontics and doing several procedures over time. My thought is, what do you do with scar tissue and how do you approach it? Do you go you know, lower segment and then you go up and correct the angle a little more as you go? Or what do you, you know, how do you think the best approach to starting something like that would be? Well, Kat, let's go on this journey together, right? You're going to be the one doing it, not me. I would tell you that we need to figure that out. Like, do you, if, let's say it's a deformity. You start at the anchor points first and work back. You start at the critical part first. I mean, this has not been even described. And anybody who even wants to open this conversation, right, will have an entire career to build. And I, I, I would think it's the opposite of what most people think. Most people say, okay, if you've got a, let's say you have a severe deformity, let's say it's coronal, the apex of scoliosis is L3-4. And most people say, well, start L3-4 because they're used to the lateral wound, right? See, see go, for the, go for the kill shot, right? Maybe we'll get L3-4 and then it'll fix it and then the patient's better. Well, we already have that technology, right? We basically kind of have that, like, we'll just fuse L3-4. Right. I would suggest it's the other way, which is build the foundation first. That requires real planning. So build T10 to L2, that track, like a railroad track. Yeah. Then you build the other side, right? The ilium, maybe SI joint. Then you build up to L3. And then the last procedure is the connection, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm just. That makes sense. So I like that. And even like with the new 3D planning rods that you can print, so you can really plan out your whole correction over time. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you go back to the old days of neurosurgery, and I, I can't remember the name of the clip. Was it the horse leak? Uh, it wasn't the hyphens. The brain surgeons know the one where you go on the carotid and you just turn a notch. Every, Roberto Harris knows you turn it every day. Um, was it horse leak? I don't know. Dandy. And it just chokes off the carotid for, I guess it's for like some kind of a shunting problem or a fistula. Like, think about how smart that was compared to what people do now. Like, actually, that's really bright. You know, that's. And and maybe there's a way. Oh, is the Silverstone clamp? <laughs> okay, silver. Okay, yeah, Silverstone clamp. So yeah, so like read the history. This is what Roberto Harris tries to teach you guys. It's not about like the story per se. The story is just to keep you to remember it. If you don't know what the neurosurgeons did 20 years ago, you're just gonna say I got this new idea. It's the old stuff. <laughs> you want to yeah. take the old stuff and make it newer, right? You want to make it better. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. Thanks. I'll, if there are no more questions. Um, I'll let everybody get off because I know it's, it's a long day. So thanks again. Take care guys. Good luck in the OR.